Our next speaker is David Eberth. He studies ancient environments of fossil bearing rocks and participates in projects that take him throughout the US, Mexico, Argentina, Germany, China, Mongolia, and Canada. His specialties include, uh oh, stra <laughs> stratigraphy. <laughs> is that right? Stratigraphy Just make it up. and sedimentology. <laughs> And chronostrata, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> the age of rocks and taf taphonomy, influences on preservation and fossilization. Geez, who wrote this? <laughs> His research not only sheds light on what the Earth's ancient environments were like, but more importantly, how they changed through time and thus what the future may hold for us. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please welcome from Lethbridge, Alberta, David Ebert. Good stuff. All right, a, a little bit of housekeeping here. If you notice in the program, it says I'm going to be talking about Fossil Hunter. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be talking, uh, I'm not going to be giving a talk about dinosaurs today, so you uh, will not be hearing anything about the Wild Rose Party. <clears throat> what I am going to talk to you about are some ideas that I've been kicking around uh, in over 30 years of uh, involving myself in the so-called evolution creationism controversy. Uh, today we're just going to explore, I think, some pretty basic concepts on why it won't go away. I always think it's a good idea for gatherings like this for us just to sit back and kind of take a macro view of what's going on. Um, I also put up three quotes here that I'm particularly fond of, and I think that, oh, unfortunately tips my hand as to uh, where I come out on this so-called controversy. All right, so there's, I, I'm not going to give you a talk about why evolution is such a satisfactory uh, approach to explaining um, the patterns we see on Earth in terms of diversity of life and their distribution. Uh, I'll just very, very quickly say that this is a, essentially a mountain of evidence that we have, and that mountain has been accumulated over more than 100 years. Uh, it includes so many different lines of evidence uh, and so many different disciplines that it's actually just a joke uh, to have to sit here and give you a talk were I to do that, supporting evolution. Uh, evidence for evolution comes from vestiges and atavisms in terms of things like the, uh, the whale's uh, vestiges of a hind limb, uh, imperfect design, uh, human's lower back, uh, the way our eyes are designed, exaptations, the uh, the co-option of previously evolved features into other features. None of these can be explained adequately unless you invoke a model like evolution. Comparative genetics, I'll skip transitional fossils for a second. Comparative genetics, i.e. The, the notion that when we compare uh, genomes of organisms that we believe are closely related, we find indeed that they are, like a chimpanzees genome sharing more than 98% similarity with that of humans. Evidence from geography and paleogeography, no problem there. We have a very peculiar distribution of forms of life on modern islands. And then when we go back into the deep past in paleogeography, it's very easy for us to explain uh, the distribution of organisms like marsupials based on the distribution of continents many tens, if not hundreds of millions of years ago. Superposition and age of fossils, obviously, this is some of the first evidence that was used back in the early 19th century to mid-19th century in support of uh, emerging ideas of evolution. And uh, of course, the granddaddy of them all, actual documentation of evolution occurring in the field and in the laboratory. Um, I'll just give you uh, a couple of examples uh, in terms of transitional fossils. Um, as a paleontologist and as a geologist, this is my ballywick, and I'm just absolutely, I've spent 30 years studying this kind of thing, and I'm absolutely astounded that we still have to have this debate when we find uh, fossils like this in Liaoning, northeastern China in 1996, uh, and then subsequently many, many hundreds of fossils, uh, feathered dinosaurs with a mosaic of physical characteristics which conclusively show us that birds and dinosaurs are very closely related and that birds can trace their ancestry back and their origins back into the dinosaurs. And this is just another photograph of a similar type of animal, Caudipteryx, with its nice uh, feathers preserved, proto-feathers preserved on the hind limb. Another transitional fossil that you may or may not be aware of that's just absolutely spectacular is Odontocelles, 
semitestaceae, uh, easy for me to say. And this is essentially turtle on a half shell. This is a specimen that was just recently described in 2009 by a colleague of mine, Wu Xiao Chun, and his colleagues in, out of southern China. A Triassic 220 million year old fossil uh, represented by multiple specimens that show that these organisms actually have an incipient shell on their venter, on their gut, covering their gut, but no dorsal shell. And their skulls are well toothed, uh, unlike modern turtles, and there's a host of other characteristics that tell us that, again, this is a mosaic of features that's emerging uh, in an evolutionary context. And here's a, a lovely little artist's reconstruction of this, of this animal on Don, Odontocelles. So we've got lots and lots of evidence. So, if, so we're, left with this, we're left with this really irritating situation. If the evidence for evolution is overwhelming, and I'm standing here in front of uh, preaching to the choir, essentially, that it is indeed overwhelming, why won't the controversy go away? So what I want to do as a paleontologist today is I want to shift away from the notion of standing here and making the case that we have this mountain of evidence for evolution. Let's just accept that we've got it. And let's step back a little bit and try to explore this notion of why the controversy won't go away. And I love the metaphor that's used by Jerry uh, Coyne in his uh, latest book, Why Evolution is True. He refers to this controversy or this conflict as the roly-poly man. And it doesn't matter how many scientists come out and marshal more and more and more evidence in support of evolution, the roly-poly man of creationism just keeps bouncing back up again. It just won't go away. So it's uh, actually a metaphor I like to keep in mind when I'm arguing with creationists because it makes me laugh. And then they think I'm mocking them, and that makes me laugh some more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in my, in my worldview, the, this controversy, you know, I'm always putting it in these semi-quotes, it's, it's a symptom. And I believe it's fairly easy to make the case that this is a symptom of a complex cultural conflict that results from the actions of a mostly American religio-political conservative movement. So really what we're looking at here, uh, we can throw all of our energy, we can throw all of our effort as scientists and educators and uh, interested community individuals into trying to make the case for evolution and fighting back the darkness of creationism, but it makes very little impact unless we approach this uh, in the knowledge that we're dealing with a movement. And what, as a movement, movements have targets and they have goals. All movements do. And so what are the goals and targets of this movement? Well, I, through my reading and my study uh, of this in many, many different sources, I think it's very easy to make the case that we're looking at uh, re, uh, a movement that's interested in renewing and expanding American culture, and I do put that in quotes, by shaping public policy to reflect evangelical, Protestant, and conservative values recasting science to allow supernatural explanations, of God, if you will, for phenomena, recasting science to promote and affirm the reality of God and the supremacy of humans on earth, uh, second tier below God, uh, and realigning science and religion to support a range of religious, political, social viewpoints and beliefs. Well, that's the goal. And if you want the evidence for this, it's very, very easy to find. One of my absolutely favorite images uh, in support of the classic 1960s version of uh, scientific creationism or creation science. We have our soldier of God busy hacking away at the tree of evolution. And by doing that, by going after this one concept, the soldier of God's going to be able to take out any issues related to abortion, humanism, racism, uniformitarianism, which is a really weird one because that's a, just a really good geological concept. Paganism, Nazism, radical feminism, New Age religions, euthanasia, communism, sexual perversion, too bad, pornography, <laughs> drug culture, and any anti-God philosophy. I mean, it's just, you know, if you're looking at the world that way, you're, you know, right on. You're going to take evolution out at all costs. It doesn't matter how much evidence there is for it. Furthermore, if we want to look around at uh, these organizations that support this movement, it's easy to find. Uh, Discovery Institute, Institute of Creation Research, Fox News, one of my favorite sources of information. And now, of course, as somebody alluded to, uh, the Sun, Sun Television, which I, 
it's really hard for me to watch that, but I have to drag myself in front of the TV every once in a while to see what nonsense is being uh, trotted out. Answers in Genesis, which is very active, a uh, group uh, promoting creationism in the schools. And then we find a variety of entertainment vehicles like the so-called uh, documentary uh, with uh, Ben Stein expelled. And we even see this in, uh, in the web, things like creation with Wiki. So we know it's there. If we drill a little deeper, uh, look at the, uh, the professed goals of these individual institutions, Discovery Institute, uh, statements like the one that's on the screen clearly indicate that this is a movement uh, to defeat scientific materialism, its destructive moral, cultural, and political legacies, to replace materialistic explanations with theistic understanding that nature and human beings are created by God. Hallelujah, pass the Tylenol. <laughs> All right. Uh, if we look at our political system here in Canada, and again, the, uh, previous, a previous speaker has alluded to this, our Minister of Science, Gary Goodyear, when asked if he believes in evolution, responded in this quixotic, lovely uh, way, stating, um, do you believe in evolution? I am a Christian, and I don't think anybody asking a question about my religion is appropriate. So, other than the fact that it's not a particularly well-read, uh, well-written statement, uh, it's just absolutely bizarre to equate the two, but that's where we stand. Uh, you can also flip this whole issue on its head, and you can see the evidence for this movement by just looking at how scientists and the scientific community are now responding. Uh, all of these books focus on the controversy, or they have portions in them dedicated to the, to the controversy. So this wonderful book by Don Prothero on evolution, what the fossils say, has major sections at the beginning and the end that talk about this movement. So it's real. So what I want to do today is uh, I've concocted my own little geometric diagram uh, that's going to allow me to organize my thoughts, and I'm just going to hit uh, what I think are the major influences on keeping this controversy going, why it won't go away. And I will argue at the end, if I don't run out of time, that if we approach these problems, and I don't care if, actually, if it's uh, homeopathic medicine problems or alternative medicine or, uh, you know, questions about the existence of God or, or not, uh, the role of atheism or secular humanism in society or evolution, we all face the same issue. We have to understand really what's behind this, or we make some really bad uh, decisions in how to deal with it. Before we do that, we've got to address uh, what we mean by some of these terms, and if we take the evolution-creationism conflict or controversy, and we just skin it down to what it really should be, all it is is about different ways to explain life's diversity, distribution, and history. That's it, right? If we take it out of this cultural perspective and this movement perspective. With evolution draw, uh, driven by natural processes over geologic time, and with evolution addressing the origin of species versus, uh, via science, uh, concluding that all life is interrelated, this is all evidence-based, and also for the present time that the origin of life is really not an aspect of what we talk about when we're talking about evolution. Creationism, on the other hand, in the general parlance, uh, is a supernatural belief and is time independent. In other words, rather than evolution, which requires lots and lots of sex over lots and lots of time, basically creationism doesn't require any sex when you really boil it down. And uh, that, that non-existence of sex can happen instantaneously. Take from that as you will. And it's basically focused on the existence of different kinds that are created independently by God or via some supernatural agent um, or via processes directed by God. And it requires faith or a gap philosophy or a variety of other strange beliefs. Now, um, the problem with this, this definition of creationism is that it really is kind of the popular view. And if we were to do just a survey in this room today and tally all those data about what creationism is, we'd probably end up with something, uh, the majority of responses including these four points. Uh, God created life in its diversity in six days, so a young earth model. Um, Microevolution occurs, but life does not evolve from one kind into another. Macroevolution 
universe, earth and life are geologically young, and morality is external, coming from God. But in fact, we all know that when we sample the beliefs, creationist beliefs out on the street, we get a huge range of beliefs. This is a 10-point chart going from the absolute wankiest views of creationism right down to what many of us here in this group uh, hold to, materialistic evolution. The popular idea of, of creationism really rests in what would be called young earth creationism, i.e. a young earth versus an old earth. It's very interesting, though, that Jehovah's Witnesses, the current dogma for Jeho Jehovah's Witnesses, they now accept an old earth, but they're really good and happy with intelligent design. And you can, we could go through this and parse it out. We could build an entire talk on what these different positions are. The take-home message is be very careful what you think you're addressing when you're dealing with creationists. Uh, you don't really know until you talk to them what their belief system is, and it is a bit of a moving target. So let's jump into this. Core beliefs. And one of my favorite core beliefs that I think is underappreciated uh, in the scientific community and broadly is the role of cultural and historical traditions. It's very important, in my opinion, that we recognize that the United States, and most of this talk is focused on belief systems and things going on in the States, the United States really has an, a, a very long and deep tradition of Protestant revivalism. Um, this is expressed in the concepts of the Great Awakenings, that, which extend right from pre-revolutionary time in the United States right into the or early part of the 20th century. And some people argue that there have been two more Great Awakenings and that we are in the midst of yet a, another one now, that the current push for creationism and this movement, this overall uh, conservative movement, is an example of another Great Awakening. And these, uh, what's interesting about these great Protestant revivalist awakenings is that although they involve the rejection of central authority, uh, they also also embody personal relationships with God, and they support the recognition of biblical authority, they've also resulted in some really good things historically. And we have to keep that in mind when we're dealing with this issue. Um, these revivalist trends have built a sense of community in an emerging country that was bootstrapping itself historically. Uh, there's a, a strong shared identity as a result of these. And all communities and countries, nationalistic organizations and countries, will develop ways to uh, increase their identity. Uh, they have also been the focal point for social and politi political activism, many of which we would agree today were good things. The development and emergence of the American democracy in the 18th century came out of the first great awakening. Uh, the freedom of religion, likewise. Uh, abolition, temperance, well, you know, we can go either way on that. Suffrage caring for the poor, so on and so forth. It's very, very important that we not distill uh, these revivalist issues as something purely negative. There were good social consequences. But the point is that once those revivals are in play, they help us understand strong reactions to seemingly relatively minor events. So if we go back to the Scopes trial in 1925, where the American Civil Liberties Union was challenging then the Butler Act in Tennessee, the act that forbade the teaching of evolution in the schools, uh, we find that the outcry uh, when this was challenged was huge, was monumental. This outcry only makes sense in the context of understanding that there's a long tradition of Protestant revivalism in the United States. It's not going to go away. It's who they are. It's part of their history. It's not easily dis um, dispensed with. Things remain quiet in the United States after that big brouhaha, and we get into a very interesting phenomenon, starting with the launch of Sputnik in Russia. We basically find that the United States is terrified that it's falling behind its uh, uh, counterpart um, in, uh, in Russia, and essentially starts taking a top-down centralized education review process that introduces evolution into the curriculum. It promotes science, it promotes uh, science as a necessary element of teaching in the schools, and that teaching should be coordinated by the, by the federal government. This is the antithesis of that, uh, of the three great awakenings of the revivalism. And we see immediately that there's a reaction to this. By 1961, we have uh, books uh, 
headed, uh, written mostly by Henry Morris, uh, appearing on the shelves, that are trying to take and place the uh, creationist view in a scientific framework. Nobody is disputing in the late 50s, early 60s, that science is good and, and is going to lead us uh, towards conquering our foes in the world and lead us all to a better future, and the creationists are quick to get on board with that. This all culminates by 1968. Think about this. 1968 is the time that the United States finally makes it legal to teach evolution in the schools. 1968, all right? I make that such a strong point because that's not that long ago. A lot of us in this room were alive back then. So you've got to keep in mind that our focus on science is a relatively anomalous uh, perspective in the context of these uh, revivalist traditions. And without going into all the detailed history, of course, we know that scientific creationism has uh, evolved and morphed into the current uh, intelligent design movement. I put this together for any of you who know what a cladogram is or, or have a sense of phylogeny. Can I just see a, a show of hands if any of you know what this is? this kind of approach of showing uh, how forms are related to each other, because I'm going to be talking about this uh, a little bit later. Um, this is a tongue-in-cheek diagram. Uh, I just couldn't resist it, because what it shows us is that once we take this historical perspective looking at the, at the controversy and looking at the evolution of creationism, we see that the pattern is very, very similar to what we see in every, any evolutionary process, where there are events that actually select for uh, different points of view, philosophical points of view that are already out there. So we have periods of time when evolution is outlawed, we see science, uh, creationism being aligned with science, uh, morphing into intelligent design, and today we live in a time when it's no longer the issue of just getting uh, uh, creationism to be looked upon as science. What we're starting to see now is the redefinition of terms. This is strongly, strongly political. And I put him in there because I just think that's funny as heck. All right. <laughs> um, core beliefs, so let's talk about religion. So that's it for, for traditions. Talk about religion. We all know that the United States is a strongly theistic nation. Uh, you can take from these data from Gallup 2011 what you will. The point is that regardless of whether we have a 92% belief in, in God in the United States, it doesn't matter, it's a very high number. Likewise, if we start posing questions about belief in evolution or whether God is involved, uh, these two lines at the top basically are creationist points of view, uh, God guiding or God creating humans in their present form, and we see a total of 78% of Americans uh, hold to that idea. Uh, if we trot these numbers out, as many uh, researchers have, and look at them across countries, we find that, no surprise, the United States ranks very high as a God-fearing nation and ranks very, very low as a evolution-accepting nation. No surprise there. And if we look at the, uh, a paper by Jerry Coyne that's uh, just going to come out here shortly in the Journal of Evolution, uh, we see that there's a, uh, a negative correlation between these uh, two beliefs. And the United States ranks just above Turkey as the uh, showing that there's a very strong correlation, belief in God and accept, acceptance of, heaven, of uh, uh, evolution. That leads a lot of people to suspect that the main target, the main culprit is uh, religion. I think there's, there's good evidence for that, but we have to, again, be very, very careful when we start looking at these numbers and these polls, we find some peculiarities that cause us to sit back a little bit. And one of these peculiarities is scientists. If you poll scientists for their belief in God versus their belief in evolution, this is the kind of pattern you get. 51% of scientists in the United States are happy to accept God, that God exists or some kind of higher power. But when we ask scientists in the United States what, where you stand on evolution, we get 87% are happy with the notion that evolution occurs. 8% uh, of them are raving, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, 2% are creationists, and we get 8% who are theistic or deistic in their, in their beliefs. The point is this, that if you look at the public, you've got an 85% of the believers, of people who believe in God, also accept creationism. But if you look at scientists, you get a much smaller number. 
And so you ask the question, what's the difference between these two groups? And it's very obvious, their level of education. Education clearly makes a difference. And indeed, if we ask, twist the questions around and we start looking at uh, belief in evolution as a function of uh, education, you get this number. So going from high school through some college, college graduate to graduate students, we see an, a very significant increase in acceptance of the concepts of evolution. No surprise there. But here's the kicker. If you ask educated people or go through the same experiment from high school, some college and grads and, and graduate students, you find relatively little change in the belief system in God. And in fact, uh, I suspect that this 87%, the 7% drop at the very end here for graduate students is only there because the graduate students finally realize that there is no God. God is actually their supervisors who hold their, complete, <laughs> their fate in their hands, and uh, that's a sobering moment for them. Uh, just an aside, if we, if we come to Canada, 58% of Canadians accept that uh, humans evolved. 22% um, are in the creationist camp. And if, unfortunately, if we look at Alberta, we are strongly in Alberta. We are strongly in line with the American values. So if you want to visit uh, the United States without going across the international border, come on over uh, and visit our little dinosaur museum. And we're struggling there to... Uh, to uh, hold the faith. But uh, for those of you who don't want to worry about Alberta or think that Alberta's problems are our problems alone, 59% of Canadians believe human beings evolved, 22% are uh, into the creationist camp. But man, you get some wacko things going on in these polling numbers. 42% of Canadians believe that humans and dinosaurs coexisted. So Houston, we have some problems. All right, education. The whole notion that uh, education is uh, um, part of the problem is, is interesting, and I think it can be defended quite easily, because a lot of concepts in science and evolution are actually quite complex. And they're a challenge for all of us to uh, demystify these concepts and make them uh, easy to understand. Let me just give you some examples here. Uh, these are two perfectly adequate definitions of science. There's no ultimate authority in what science is. The important point in both of those definitions, we can make the definition as complicated as you wish, but one of the important points is that we always ground our definition in the notion of natural explanations, natural evidence. If we go to a creationist site in Alberta that's uh, busy trying to su supply information to homeschoolers, they answer the question, what is science? Look at this definition. Just read it to yourself. There's really nothing on the face of it that doesn't really look that bad. The only difference is they've taken the word natural out, right? Which leads us to look at the cartoon down below. They would allow any explanation, including supernatural. So if you have this kind of subtlety in your definitions, it becomes very, very difficult uh, to keep people focused on what the definitions are and why they're important. What else about science, as we all know in this room, Conclusions must be able to be tested. Um, we have to be able to make predictions. Uh, science must be self-correcting. We'll talk about Archaeoraptor at the end if I don't run out of time. And conclusions are always provisional. And as I like to say here, I've lived through three different uh, paradigms in terms of dinosaur extinctions. So, and I expect more long after I'm dead in terms of understanding what went on there. So this is also what science is about. Let's go back to our creationist site in Alberta. And they're providing this lovely information for the homeschoolers. What is creation science? I love this. Creation scientists have a worldview or model hmm, for their science, which is based on the belief that an intelligent designer exists who created our universe and everything in it. Game over. It's great. I mean, everything goes, right? Uh, the cartoon in support of this is the, the whole notion that scientists are hamstrung. I mean, we've got to play by the rules. These guys don't. They already know what the answer is and off they're running. I'm not telling you anything uh, you don't already know. But this is where these definitions become very, very important and easily subverted. The whole notion of what a theory is, I know you guys have been hit over the head with this a million times and you've all read about it, but it's true. Theories in a scientific context are well established, well tested, they explain a lot and they're highly predictive. The theory of plate tectonics, yes, it's just a theory, but it sure helped us make sense of what happened in Japan last year. 
and made some predictions about those aftershocks that were coming. And of course, theory and popular usage is essentially an untested idea or hunch. And uh, the example I like to use is my theory is that the Kennedy brothers killed Marilyn Monroe. And you know, I'm off and running and I don't have to change my mind on that. Materialism, very, very nasty concept, uh, easily misunderstood. Uh, scientists use the term materialism in context of a method, that we use a scientific method which is inherently by definition materialistic. Simply because we have no way of testing supernatural explanations, we are limited to materialism. So we look at materialism as a method that we use in doing our science. But there's also philosophical materialism, and many of you here, I assume, are philosophical materialists, rejecting God and saying, materialism is all that exists in the universe. That's one end of that spectrum. Theism is obvious. God is involved in some way, uh, is real, and is involved in the, the universe in some way. But what we find in the creationist literature is new terms cropping up. Scientific materialism, which is complete propaganda, it's not a term that anybody's used except creationists. And the idea here is it's a pejorative term for modern science. So what we see in terms of the standard uses of materialists, all scientists are methodological materialists, and some scientists are philosophical materialists. What the creationists want to do is shift that argument to uh, you're either with us theistically or you're against us, scientific materialists, and you're all atheists. Easy to screw these terms up. Easy to be misunderstood. Evolution, well, if you think science is bad, oh my God, evolution as a term lends itself. We couldn't have designed a better term to be misunderstood if we tried. We couldn't have done it. It would have been impossible. So what is evolution? According to Darwin, descent with modification. Hmm, sounds fancy, but what is that really? Changes in heritable features in populations over time. I can strip it down that far and no farther. Modification in these terms are initiated by randomly occurring variation and mutations, but they become established, those, those modifications become established in populations non-randomly via natural selection and some other uh, mechanisms, which are theories. And of course, diversity and distribution of life is a result of descent with modification. So here's the problem with evolution. It's a fact, we can observe it, it's a theory, that uh, the concept of evolution also is embracing uh, the mechanisms, natural selection, genetic drift, so on and so forth. So it's both fact, it's also theory, and as a paleontologist, I can tell you, evolution is also a pattern. The pattern we see in the rock record, the distribution of fossils, creates a pattern that we refer to as evolution. So now we have the word referring to three different concepts, and we can observe it, we can induce it, we can deduce it, it's all over the map. It lends itself to absolute chaos. There's both honest confusion surrounding the term and there's dishonest mis misuse of the term, which is guaranteed. This is one of the best quotes uh, from, the member, from a member of the public that I can think of in support of this whole problem with evolution. I love it. I'm going to read this thing out. Creationists believe that the naturalistic basis of science is in fact atheistic. That's that uh, scientific materialism coming up again. And that if we don't change science, we can't believe in God. So this is really an attack on all of science. And here it is. Evolution is just the weak link. And he's right. It's a complex idea. It's easy to subvert it. So what we find, here are some examples of misuse of evolution. Uh, is this a fact uh, taken from a creationist website? And the implication here is that this evolves into this, involves into this, so on and so forth. Um, and the statement is, if humans evolve from apes, how come there are still apes around? A complete misunderstanding of evolution because nobody in evolutionary biology has argued that uh, evolution is a progressive process that wipes out all antecedents. It creates a bush, a divergence, increasing divergence within life and increases diversity over time under uh, normal circumstances. And Darwin understood this. This was the whole point of his book. This is the single image that he had. This is the only figure that, it, that occurs in the uh, origin of species. It's a bush. It's theoretical. He's not talking about any real tax, but it's a, it's a bush. And in fact, today, we have huge amounts. I'm not going to weigh you down with all sorts of cladograms and phylogenetic diagrams, but we have huge amounts of evidence that shows and documents this bushy nation, uh, nature of evolution. So in fact, to answer the creationist questions, 
if we try to impose an unrealistic ancestor descendant model on their evolutionary uh, transformation, is this a fact? No, they're right, it's not a fact. But if we look at it in terms of modern uh, biology and our understanding of evolution, yes, it is a fact in that we see a hierarchy of closeness of de descent. These are not con complex ideas, but they're easily, um, any one of them is easily misrepresented. Scientists have been their own worst enemies because when we go to c communicate with the public, we try to simplify things down and we make mistakes that are then attacked. So here's uh, a diagram showing horse evolution uh, that was published in 1926 and it's actually modified from the 1880s. So it's fair to call this a progressive sense of evolution in horses uh, from the late 19th century. And this, I mean, it's very easy to see that if creationists keep being faced with this, they're going to go, well, why are these individuals still around if, uh, in the past if, this, uh, if all of them have evolved just sequentially, uh, culminating in modern horses? Um, what we see in, the in 1985 is a move towards these bushier representations, and then today, largely in response to the challenge of creationists. This is a good thing. Uh, very few good things, but here's, here's a good thing in terms of the challenges of creationists. We find that branching diagrams uh, showing this hierarchy of descent are now de rigueur in depicting our uh, phylogenies and uh, evolutionary trees. The problem is also compounded when we try to talk about the large canvas of evolution. So if I'm trying to talk about amniote evolution, in, uh, within reptiles, and I'm including dinosaurs and mammals and birds and plesiosaurs and primitive, more primitive forms of reptiles, I can't put in every branching diagram that ever existed. So I simplify it. I create this kind of diagram when I'm talking to the public, and of course this is easily misrepresented. The creationists want to know why a turtle doesn't give rise to a crocodile. I've never seen a um, uh, half turtle, half crocodile animal. And point of fact, as I just said, if we try to include every branch, this is just a phylogeny of myriad, uh, mur muroid rodents. Um, you can imagine what happens when you include all vertebrates. It's an incomprehensible diagram. But of course, this is easily misrepresented. Here's a, a diagram from Dwayne Gish. Uh, you know, he gets lots of, he, you know, he gets lots of supporters for this. He wants to see why, you know, how come we don't find cows evolving into whales in, in two generations with... Uh, an intermediate cow head and, uh, mm, all right. Uneven advocacy in education. Uh, I'm going to speed things up now a little bit, not as much detail in the rest of the talk. But um, I would argue, based on my experiences, that books, television, uh, shows, documentaries really target the, edu the educated. We're preaching to the choir. So we have to be very, very careful in our advocacy uh, to try to reach out to all aspects of our culture. We see this, I think, more profoundly in what's going on in museums. I work at a museum in Alberta. Uh, I have lots of colleagues who work in museums around the world. We did an exhibit in 2009 called I Think, which was a celebration of Darwin and his ideas. However, that, that exhibit came very close to not happening, and we were required, when I was writing the text, I had to send all of the text up to Edmonton to be vetted by politicians. Tell me, that, tell me that doesn't have a cooling effect on what you're doing. Of course, I find it amusing, but I'm a peculiar entity anyway. Um, the Royal Saskatchewan Museum was not so lucky. They wanted to do an exhibit on Darwin, and they were disallowed because it was deemed, quote, too controversial. Whoa. All right. Uh, right out of the headlines, Belfast Museum faces legal battle over Darwin exhibit, and the ROM ran into real problems with the Dar their Darwin exhibit, frightening off corporate sponsors and then eventually getting um, two major backers to support that exhibit. School systems, school system in Alberta has, uh, as of about 10, 11 years ago, moved the earth sciences curriculum down into below the high school level and dumbed it down to the point where it doesn't really even matter if the mention of evolution is in there. It's just complete nonsense at this stage of the game. Um, and of course, what I like to talk about uh, Debates, the problem of trying to debate creationists as a form of education. Uh, you will find the scientific community is split. Uh, some people like doing debates, some people hate doing debates. The reasons against doing debates is that it's about rhetoric, not about science. There's no bad publicity for creationists. Win, uh, draw, or lose, they win because they're put up right next to a bona fide scientist. So that's good for them. Easy to misrepresent the science, we just talked about that. Fallacy of shared philosophical platforms, go back to materialism. 
and the fallacy of equal time and ideas. I'm sorry, it takes a hell of a lot more time to explain evolution and science than it does to say God did it. Right? So that's, those are reasons why scientists don't like to do um, debates. Politics. Polit uh, the politicization of science, I think, is obvious to all of us, and also religio-cultural advocacy. Great little study done by Dittmar Graf in Europe in 2009. It's a study of 1,228 college students, and after all the rigmarole, uh, his data indicated to him that the most likely predictor of creationism emerging in Germany is a lack of confidence in science. Um, followed closely by a poor understanding of scientific principles, which we've already addressed. And in fact, I would argue that we see this happening everywhere. Uh, the panel this morning was a classic example of exactly the same thing going on. What we see, modern science is perceived as contentious, debatable, democratized. Anybody's opinion is worth everybody else's opinion. And so all of these areas that science weighs in on are now becoming controversial. I love this little uh, cartoon that I pulled off the web. Here we have a tiny little nub of a pencil, which is generating the actual facts and evidence. We have this huge eraser on the end of the, of the pencil. And political influence. Let's just modify the science, and we'll fire people and muzzle them and tuck them away somewhere. Religio-cultural advocacy among creationists, politically, is very, very effective. And uh, we've got to do a, a much better job. And essentially, the movement that I'm talking about, the creationist movement and the, the conservative movement, shifted from the churches to, the crea to creationist organizations in the 1960s. So we have all of those organizations that I put on in an earlier slide. That's a very smart move, a very intelligent move. Um, all of those uh, agencies do a whole bunch of things. They put out publications, lectures, workshops. They, in they build their own museums for crying out loud. They hit the homeschoolers, they encourage homeschooling, and then they put out uh, information for the homeschooling market. They uh, shoot documentaries, they work with the churches, um, they work together, and they provide legal support and advice for politicians. Man, if that's not a movement, I don't know what is. We see this in the latest little dust-up down in the United States regarding the law in Tennessee that was just enacted, uh, referred to as the monkey bill. This just came in last month. And what we find there is a whole host of wonderful propaganda being used as advocacy. So as you scan through the literature, you go on the web and, and read stories about the uh, emergence of the Tennessee Monkey Bill, which is a bill that allows teachers to teach the controversy, to provide information about alter alternative uh, theories to evolution. We find all of these terms being used and see if some of these don't resonate with us. Teach the controversy. This is about fairness. This is about academic freedom. That's the old Ben Stein line in, in uh, Expelled. This is a press release from the Discovery Center. They, they've just run off and said, yeah, this is about academic freedom. Academic freedom is a good thing, right? We want that. And critical thinking. Um, Linda, I think this was what you were talking about last night, right? Uh, critical thinking is, is, quote, and so here's, the, uh, here's one of the, uh, the quotes, critical thinking fosters good science. Can't argue with the statement, right? That's great advocacy. Don't be complacent. Uh, second to last issue here, sick versus healthy societies. This is all drawn from the work of Gregory Paul. If you're not aware of this, you should be. Good stuff. Gregory Paul is actually a dinosaur paleontologist who, like me, has really gotten the bug about this issue. And basically, to make a very long story short, he developed his own index of social health, uh, looking at 25 parameters with the idea of what makes for a healthy society versus a sick society. This include things like income disparity, homicide, uh, abortion, so on and so forth. And then applied this to 17 first world nations and developed what's called the successful society scale. When he does that, what he finds is the United States is clustering down here by itself and comes in very low on the successful society scale, is essentially viewed, in his opinion, as a dysfunctional society. Canada is up here, just slightly above the mid-mark. And if we take some quotes out of his work, this is from a variety of, of papers, uh, much more Christian uh, U.S. Is, more, is most dysfunctional uh, nation. 
Least godly democracies enjoy the best overall socioeconomic conditions. And again, um, uh, Berkshire was just talking about this. For most people, religiosity is a superficial psychological response to a dysfunctionally insecure socioeconomic environment in which invented gods are petitioned for aid and assistance. In other words, uh, if your life's not going so good, there's probably going to be a, a large incidence, a high incidence of uh, belief in God. Jerry Coyne has picked up um, this whole notion in his uh, upcoming paper in Journal of, Geo of uh, Evolution, and uh, he has basically taken one step further, takes Paul's successful society scale, and then locks on a whole pile of other data in terms of acceptance of human uh, evolution. And again, from a scientific point of view, we see a very strong uh, positive correlation in this, in this case. If you're a, uh, a sick society, chances are you're really going to reject uh, evolution. And uh, he goes on further to say that our main target should be religion. I tend to disagree with that. I think it's, there's no question that religion's at the core of this issue, but how we attack it becomes the issue. Can't meet it head on, it's just not gonna work. Lastly, ethics. Uh, this is probably what I should call the frustration factor. I've been playing this game for 30 years. And I was telling a couple people this morning, uh, I'm really, I'm uber bored when it comes to this topic. Um, I find nothing new coming from the creationists, nothing to stimulate me. So I have to find new ways to approach it. What you're seeing in this talk is one of the ways that I keep myself interested, exploring the sociological, the, the, the cultural aspects of it. But nonetheless, lack of ethics. Uh, let's get back to this. Creationism is often a campaign of repetitious misinformation. Here's some of that misinformation. Uh, evolution is controversial among scientists. There's no evolution in the lab, no transitional forms, misrepresentation of the history, Evolution is false, therefore creationism must be true, and then misrepresentations of basic science in other uh, areas. Uh, classic example of this uh, lack of ethics is the rebranding of creationism as intelligent design. There have been a number of books written about this, and I'm, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with what happened here. But basically we find the main proponents of intelligent design claiming today that intelligent design does not require a Judeo-Christian God, and therefore they're not promoting religion. Well, that's absolute lie. It's as bold-faced a lie as you can get, because you can find all of these individuals stating when they're talking to other audiences who are friendly, when they're preaching to their choir, you'll find statements like this. The objective is to convince people that Darwinism is inherently atheistic, thus shifting the debate from creationism uh, to the existence of God. Um, and then finally, to bring them to Jesus. And if that's not religion, I don't know what is. All right, so essentially it's okay for creationists to misrepresent the facts, science, math, to quote mine, or do whatever is necessary to carry the day. So how does a group like this claim moral superiority and rationalize their unethical behavior? How do you do that? And I think the key to this way of thinking really comes out in uh, uh, Ken uh, Miller's book when he was talking to Henry Morris after he kicked his butt in a, in a debate down in Florida. Uh, in response to the question of, do you actually believe all this stuff? Henry Miller's response is, scientific data aren't the authority. Scripture tells us what is right. If science isn't in line with us, then we have to keep working until we get the right answer. It says it all. Uh, I have my own little example of this. Um, I'm going to borrow one more minute to tell you about this. In Drumheller, there's a pastor, creationist, Blaine McDonald, and he made some out outrageous comments in the local newspaper. I just couldn't let it go. I just, you know, it was like, I, I rose to the bait. What could I say? And basically, I wrote a little comment that says, you know, he doesn't, evolution, an acceptance of evolution doesn't mean you're an atheist necessarily. And there are lots of uh, religious or theistic evolutionary biologies, and I listed a bunch. It was a very small response. Well, that response generated a full page you know, editorial from Blaine, right? Great, he's got it. I've got I got Dave to do what I wanted him to do. Now I can put all my evidence against uh, evolution here. And I was reading this. I got to tell you this. This is hilarious. I was reading this, and I was, I was sitting there going, my heart was racing. Why is my heart racing? I'm reading this and going, ah, oh, shit. Now I'm going to have to respond to this. And I'm reading it over lunch, the local cafe, and I realized that it's, the, it's one of the best written pieces I've ever seen out of Drumheller in the newspaper. So I went home and I, I just grabbed one of the paragraphs, put it into Google and search. So here's a pastor, a teacher, a promoter of uh, religious beliefs, a 
person who's making statements every week in the newspaper about morality, plagiarizing from a creationist site. So this was my response, because my wife, God bless her soul, she said, <laughs> she says, don't call him a plagiarist, because all you're going to do is tack him to the cross, and then the whole debate shifts over to, oh, those scientists are, are uh, crucifying you know, the true believers. So this was my response. Mr. McDonald did not indicate the paragraphs of his letter also appear word for word on the creation research apologetic site of Dr. J.C. Phillip. Because Mr. McDonald has claimed Phillip's words as his own, it appears that my disagreement is actually with Dr. Phillip. And then <laughs> for, the, for, for the remainder of the letter, I intentionally used Dr. Phillip's name. Dr. Phillip says this, Dr. Phillip says that. All right. How about lack of ethics and honesty in evolutionary studies? I don't want to go into the details of this. This is an animal that was called Archaeoraptor back in 1999. Long story short, this animal had been cobbled together by a peasant in China. It turned out to be a mixture of three different animals. A little dinosaur, a bird, Cretaceous bird, Cretaceous dinosaur, and an animal that still hasn't been published on. So, science being a self-correcting exercise. By 2002, the cat was out of the bag, faces were red, the, the, the uh, problem was solved. We knew that this was two different animals. Um, there was a great deal of embarrassment, but science worked. We got the problem solved in three years. And it turns out that one of the animals, Microraptor, is even more bizarre than the original thoughts about Archaeoraptor, the animal that was faked. Turns out that Microraptor is a four-winged dinosaur, a gliding animal, not a bird. That picture. I mean, yeah, talk about the beauty of how science works. However, if you go, go right now, if you're, if you're bored with what I'm talking about, and you're playing with your, your handhelds, just go on to Wiki, uh, Creation Wiki, and you'll find that this is all misrepresented. Archaeoraptor is a bird, the scientists uh, got it all wrong. So they're still misrepresenting how the science actually works. We cleaned this up in 2002, and here we are 10 years later, and Archaeoraptor is still being misrepresented. And in fact, if you go to Wikipedia, bless their hearts, they've got the story right. So if you want a classic example, just type in Archaeoraptor, go to Creation Wiki, and go to Wikipedia. See for yourself. All right, conclusions. I'm way over time. I apologize. Uh, the, the controversy is the cultural conflict resulting from the actions of a religious and politically conservative movement. It's driven by, in my opinion, religious, religion, traditions, poor science literacy, uneven science advocacy, politics, poor socioeconomic conditions, absence of shared ethical framework. If that's the case, then it cannot be addressed by one root. We can't take on this issue by doing more and more and more science. That's not going to solve the issue. Religion is the primary influence but education is a very, very important factor, so we can't give up on education, although it drives us all crazy to see this crap repeated over and over. And uh, in my opinion, science and religion, I didn't talk about this, but science and religion accommodation is helpful, but it's not the solution either. That's a political solution that just doesn't really quite cut it. I think we need far more science advocacy. I'm becoming much more motivated myself to get out and give talks and to really stir the pot, and I'm no longer afraid uh, to cross the lines in terms of talking to different kinds of audiences and invoking a uh, variety of other uh, causes for this. So we need to make science advocacy much more political in the future. And that is all I have to say. Thank you.